a rabid mob overran the U.S. Capitol. This had not happened since 1812. The mob broke windows, destroyed property, put lawmakers in fear for their lives. Thousands of people out for blood. All over a lie. This country has changed. I'm sure you have noticed it and seen it. The lamb is not only speaking as a dragon. The lamb is acting like a dragon. The Spirit of Prophecy says that in the last days, people will point to the calamities on land and sea, to the storm of wind, floods and earthquakes, the destruction by fire, and say, these are God's judgments because Sunday is not sacredly observed. And they will point to God's Sabbath keepers as responsible for the calamities. All based on a lie. So if you didn't think this could happen, God is pointing us to that incident as Exhibit A. A mob overruns the U.S. Capitol over a lie. And they will come after us too, after God's people also, over a lie. But God will be the deliverer. The question today, church, will you remain loyal to God or will you deny him in order to save your job, your family, or your life? Title of the sermon today, A Question of Loyalty. A Question of Loyalty. Today's sermon is taken from one of my favorite stories in the Bible, one that I know you're all familiar with is taken from Daniel chapter 6. The story of Daniel in the lion's den. You know the story quite well. We've read the story. We've perhaps seen movies on the story. But I believe that by God's grace, there's more there that we can extract from it. All. Every time you look at a story in the Bible for the upteenth time, the Lord always manages to allow us to extract some additional jewel from the story that we can use in our lives today. Turn with me, if you will, to Daniel chapter 6. By way of introduction, some of this, of course, you know the story, so it'll be some review for you. Daniel chapter 6. King Darius appoints 120 governors over the land. He then appoints three presidents over the governors. And Daniel is one of the presidents. In Daniel 6.3, the Bible says that then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes. He was preferred. Why was he preferred? The verse tells us because an excellent spirit was in him. An excellent spirit was in him. That word excellent means extraordinary. And just so you don't take this casually, that word extraordinary refers not only to his wisdom, but to his loyalty, his integrity, and his faithfulness. Daniel was a different person. He had an excellent spirit. And this is not the only time that the Bible mentions that he had an excellent spirit. In Daniel 4, you don't have to turn there, but in Daniel 4, 8, Nebuchadnezzar said that Daniel possessed the spirit of the holy gods because it is the only way that King Nebuchadnezzar could describe Daniel's spirit. It was something different about it. In Daniel 5, 11, the queen, 5, 11, and 12, the, the queen said that Daniel had an excellent spirit. 
Daniel was 80 years old at the time. He had not changed. He was a picture of spiritual consistency. His reputation preceded him. As I, as I describe this, I hope you're thinking in, about yourselves. I hope you're thinking about your lives. Because see, Daniel, I'm describing Daniel, but I ought to be describing each and every one of us as God's children. That's right. Amen. He was a picture of consistency. At 80 years old, everyone knew him. And they knew what he stood for. This, was, this is God's ideal for his people in the last days. That he, they would be a picture of spiritual consistency. No matter what's happening around them, people know where God's people stand. It's a question of loyalty. No matter what's going on, when they see you, when they see God's people, they see an extraordinary spirit. An excellent spirit. When things are great, excellent spirit. When things are not so good, excellent spirit. When problems seem impossible to overcome an excellent spirit mm -hmm. extraordinary spirit this was Daniel he was immovable because he had the spirit of God in him nothing could shake Daniel and God's ideal is that nothing not COVID not anything will shake his people in these last days when things begin to get rougher and more difficult God says I don't want my people to shake. Yes. I want them to be firm and have an extraordinary spirit and be immovable. So Daniel stood out in these difficult times when darkness is all around. People ought to be able to look at God's church, God's people, and say, there is something different about them. They are not fearful like everyone else. This, this COVID thing does not, does not seem to attack them like it attacks other folks. They are not, they are not hateful like other people. There, there is something different about them. They have an extraordinary spirit. This is what Daniel had. An extraordinary spirit. And the Bible says in verse 3 that because of this extraordinary spirit, this excellent spirit, the king thought to set him over everything. Everything. And here comes the jealousy. <laughs> the other cabinet members became angry and jealous. Who is this outsider? He's not one of us. He's not of the Medes and Persians. See, Daniel was from the captivity in Babylonia. He wasn't part of the, the Mede or Persian clan. He was an outsider. God's people will always be outsiders. But God will find a way to put you into the mix, to give you influence so that you can draw others to him. The Spirit of Prophecy in Christ's Object Lessons, page 340, Sister White talks about this sphere of influence that we all have. She says, the greater the influence the greater the good that we can do. Each one of us has a sphere of influence. No matter where we are, right. we have it. Either that influence is drawing people to God or is drawing them away from God. It's doing one or the other. Our sphere of influence. Daniel had this sphere of influence and it was very broad. And his life drew people to God. Your life, your life is to draw people to God's kingdom. It is to draw people to God. This is why God has, has you on this earth today. 
There's nothing more important than allowing God to use you to draw people to him. We're talking about life and death. What could be more important than drawing a soul to God to save that soul for eternal life? What could be more important than that? Everything in Daniel's life was wrapped up in drawing people to God so that they could be saved. And that is God's ideal for his people. Everything, what Daniel stood for, everything he did had the sole purpose of allowing his sphere of influence to draw people to God so that they could be saved. So the jealousy sets in now, church. The other cabinet members are upset that this outsider has come in here and made these kind of waves. And now the king prefers him over us. And that will be the case for God's people. Daniel knew they were angry. He knew they were jealous. He didn't flaunt that. You see, sometimes we have a tendency to get mad at folks that, 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 despise us or, or, or might be jealous and we tend to get mad at them because they're trying to undermine us but you have to understand this one thing they don't know what you know they don't have the spirit that, that you have they haven't met this God that you know and so what you need to do when they try to undermine you when they don't like you you need to pray for them because they don't quite understand they don't know what you know that's why Christ said Lord forgive them for they know not what they do they didn't know what they were doing that's why Stephen, Stephen said the same thing. But once they know the beauty of the glory of God, once they know, then they understand. Daniel knew. Daniel understood. And they were jealous. And so in verse 4, the Bible tells us, then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. That means they wanted to find some fault in him. Something they could use against him, to, to bring him down, to, to get him out of the king's graces. But here's the beauty of that. They looked. They looked high and low, east and west, and they could not find anything. Now, if you think about that, surely, surely, there was some bad habit that he kept secret. Surely there was some secret indulgence that he had. What about all those beautiful women in the palace? Surely he was at one point in time tempted to no. No, nothing, church. Nothing. They found nothing because there was nothing in him. Nothing that Satan could use against him. Sound familiar? Jesus said, there was nothing in me. As I describe the character of Daniel, you ought to be thinking about the character of Jesus, and then you ought to be thinking, wait a minute, if Daniel can have it, why can't I? Oh, you certainly most, you most certainly can, and you most certainly will have this character. You most certainly have to have this character, and God is pleading to give it to you, the character of Daniel. This is where, this is where, we have to be. There was nothing in Daniel that Satan could use against him. And for those of you who feel you are not good enough today, for those of you who feel that you are not living up to the standard, I want to assure you today that you can with the grace of God. Amen. You can meet the mark. You can reach this mark. You can be a Daniel yeah. by the grace of God. And you must you can't be satisfied with the mediocre. You can't just be satisfied with staying where you are. You must grow and grow and grow because God has plans for you. That's right. Amen. Daniel is but an example of the great things that God wants to do through his people today. That's why God tells us, in Isaiah 118, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as well. God says, stop resisting, my spirit. You can be, you can have the character just like Daniel. 
Just stop resisting me. Come, let, let's reason together. I can get rid of those bad habits. I can get rid of that struggle that you have. Just, just come reason with me because I'm trying to save you. Stop fighting my spirit. Let that sin go. Release that bad habit to me and let me make you clean like Daniel. And then you and I together can do great things. They hated Daniel. They hated Daniel. 1 John 3.13. You can write down some of these verses. We won't go to all of them. We'll go to some of them. But they hated Daniel. In 1 John 3.13 it says, John says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Turn with me to John 15.18. Turn with me to John 15. We're going to actually read John 15. 18 and 19. This is what Christ says. Now they hated Daniel. They hate him. We're going to talk about in a second why they hated him. But we're going to look at John 15, 18 and 19. Here's what it says. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before they hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Now, that's just a fact. As a follower of God, you will be hated by the world. There is nothing you can do about that fact but remain loyal to God. No one wants to be hated. Christ says, as they hated me, they will hate you. Now, why did they hate Christ? Why did they hate him? I'm going to read for you a quote. So you can see why they hated Christ, why they hated Daniel, and why they're going to hate you. You need to know that. Desire of Ages, page 243. But it was not simply the absence of outward glory in his life that led the Jews to reject Jesus. He was the embodiment of purity. And they were impure. He dwelt among men an example of spotless integrity. His blameless life flashed light upon their hearts. His sincerity revealed their insincerity. It made manifest the hollowness of their pretentious piety and discovered iniquity to them in its odious character. Such a light was unwelcome. Jesus' very life Allow them to see the corruption in their life. And they hated it. Just being in his presence, they knew they weren't right. And they hated it. You see, when God points out to us our character, ourselves, when we are able to see the condition that we are in, we have a choice. We can say, Lord, I see it. It's ugly. I don't like it. Change it. Yes. Or we can say, oh, no. I don't like it. There's nothing wrong with it. Leave it alone, Lord. I don't want it changed. That's our choice. Why would Christ, his mere presence, point out their faults to them? Why would that be a benefit to them when they despised and hated it? Because it gave them a choice. This is your true condition. What do you want to do with it? Do you want it gone? Do you want God to extract this filth out of your life? Or do you want to hold on to the filth? That's the same question that is ought to be asked every single day in our lives. Lord, you have shown me my filth. Now it's up to me whether or not I'm going to allow you to get rid of it or I'm going to hold on to it. Well, Daniel allowed God to take out all the filth and he was blameless. And that's why he had an extraordinary spirit. So this is why they hated Daniel. Because his very life revealed the corruption in their life. And that's why they will hate you too. Nobody wants to be hated. Nobody wants to be hated. And the dangerous temptation 
for God's people in these last days is that we will choose to compromise rather than behave. We will choose to change our beliefs rather than be viewed as odd or fanatical. Daniel did not want to be hated, but this was the cost of following God. It is the cost. Count the cost, church. It is the cost. So the question you must ask yourselves, not that you're looking for someone to hate you, but the question you must ask yourself is, do I have haters? Because Jesus says that you will. So if you don't, what does that mean? Jesus says, my followers, they will hate. She says, his sincerity revealed their insincerity. His very life condemned them, church. That's why they hated him. Do we have haters? When your character, when our characters come to reflect his, we will. We will. God wants to give you, God wants to give each and every one of us that character so that we can represent him as Daniel did. Daniel did. Daniel's love for God was greater than his desire to be loved by the world. This is what Christ, this is where he wants to get us all to. That made, that very fact that God, that Daniel loved God more than anything or anyone made him spiritually unstoppable. There was nothing that could possibly get in his way because God was first in his life. Listen to this quote. Christ Object Lessons, same page, page 340. When those who profess to serve God follow Christ's example, practicing the principles of the law in their daily life, when every act bears witness that they love God supremely and their neighbor as themselves, then will the world, then will the church have power to move the world. Oh, there's so many great things that God is planning to do through his church. If they just would submit to him and allow them to allow him to fill us with his purity and his goodness. God would allow us to use this sphere of influence to draw others to him so that they could be saved. Amen. Thank you. you will see that in this story involving Daniel and his influence, his influence moved that kingdom where he was. And your influence is to move wherever you are, whether it's on your job, your influence should move that job in some way. If you're at home, your influence should move your home some way. No matter where you're at, your sphere of influence, because you have that, that excellent spirit, that extraordinary spirit in you that God has placed in you, it makes you different. And it gives you this sphere of influence that just moves no matter where you're at. Just like Daniel. God's ideal for his people. That they just move no matter where they go. I, had a, I tell the story of my grandmother who was a Bible worker. It's amazing how she was called by God, but she was. And at times, you know, in church, you have these discussions, and the folks would be arguing about something. Whenever my grandmother walked into the room, hmm. they just stopped arguing. Hmm. It was like every, the whole atmosphere changed. Hmm. My grandmother, uh, the way she became a Bible worker, briefly I'll tell you, is that she, she was a very successful beautician along the lines of Madam Walker in Cleveland, Ohio. I've been over there, and they still have in her beauty shop, in the Historical Books, Ohio, her name in her beauty shop. It was historical. She was making a lot of money. And God gave her a dream and said, I need you to leave this and become a Bible worker. And she was shocked. Never needless to say, she left. She became a Bible worker. And one day, I was in church, and they had a little celebration to celebrate her. She had been in church a number of years. And they said, 
I want everyone to stand in this church who will, who brought, who came in the church as a result of Miss Sterling's Bible study. Do you know that church had over 300 people? Do you know over 200 plus people stood up? Mercy. Amen. Amen. Then I understood why God called her from what she was doing. What she was doing was not important. What she did for God, now that was important. Amen. When you saw all those 200 people standing up. See, that's what God wants to do through his people. Amen. She didn't see at the time why God would call her from this very successful business. But what can be more important than saving souls for the kingdom of God? What can be more important than that? <coughs> Your careers are not as important Sorry. as saving souls. Your goals, as I talked about this morning, are not as important as saving souls for the kingdom of God. Nothing can be more important. So these, these individuals, these, these princes and these other presidents begin to scheme. They want to get rid of Daniel. They can't stand him. That little picture of perfection. They can't stand it. His mere presence makes them feel guilty. They want to take him out. And so they can't find any fault in him, so they continue to deliberate. What can we do? How can we get this man? He's a thorn on our side. He's taking all our privileges. The king prefers him over us. And now the king wants to put him over everything. We can't have that. He's an outsider. He doesn't belong here. we got to do something. So in verse 5, you see, then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this man. They couldn't find anything. Life is too pure. Except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. But listen carefully now. He had no fault in himself that they could use. But there is one thing that they knew about him. They knew, listen carefully, they knew that he loved God more than anything and anyone. They knew that. So, what we have to do, they said, they said, we have to force him to choose between the king and his God. And we know that he'll choose his God. Now, you think about that, how incredible that is. The fact that they knew that Daniel would not defy his God is a testimony. Amen. Think about that. Daniel's close relationship with God was so obvious that even his enemies knew that he would not defy his God. Even his enemies knew that. <coughs> and if his enemies knew that, think about the other folk that knew it. You see how powerful his sphere of influence was? Even his enemies knew that he loved God more than anything. But they planned now to use that against him. That that was the only way they could get him is to force him to choose between the king whom he loved and loved him and his God. They knew that he would choose his God. Do your colleagues know who you would choose? Do your friends know that God is more important to you than anything or anyone? Do they know? Do they look at you and say, wait a minute, we can't do that because we know what he'll do. Or we know what she'll do. Because God is more important to her. God is more important than him than anything. Do they know that about you? See, this, this, this is what they knew about Daniel. This is, what, this is where God needs us to be. Folk look at you and say, oh, oh, they know you. Your enemies ought to know where you stand. They knew where Daniel stood. They couldn't stand him, but they knew where he stood. They may not like you, but they ought to know where you stand. That's right. Amen. They ought to know where you stand. And they ought to know that your love for God exceeds anything, anything Amen. that could possibly be in your life. Think about that. Daniel's love for God, Daniel's love for God, that he loved God more than anything. You know that there drove other folk to come ask him, wait a minute, now, what is it? Why do you love God more than anything? You know this gave him a chance to witness. 
about God's goodness to him. You know it did. Just his very life drove them to ask him, man, this, this brother loves God more than anything or anyone. Nothing can come between him and his God. Nothing between his soul and his God. Does it remind you of a song? Amen. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. There is nothing between Daniel and his God. There ought to be nothing between you and your God. When others see you, when your friends interact with you, when your family, family who may not be in the church, they ought to know that there is nothing on this earth that you will allow to come between you and God. They ought to know that just by your life. You shouldn't have to tell them that. They should be able to see it. Daniel didn't have to tell them. They knew it. They knew it. And that's why they were able to concoct this scheme to force him to choose between the king and God. Because they knew where he stood. Folk, we gotta know. They gotta know what you stand in these last days. There's too much foolishness going on in this world. This world needs to know where the people of God stand. And you shouldn't have to say anything. They ought to be able to look at your life and tell what you stand. Sister White says that your life is the greatest sermon you can possibly give. Just by living for God, folk will look at you and say, wait a minute. This brother or this sister loved God more than anything. This was the situation with Daniel. And they knew where he stood. And they must know where you stand today, especially now. There's too much foolishness going on in this world. God needs some Daniels today. Amen. He needs some Daniels today. Yes. So these, these haters... These haters, they go to the king and they convince him to pass a decree that they know will force Daniel to choose between the king and God. A decree, by the way, according to the law of the Medes and Perts, cannot be changed. The decree could not be changed. The decree says that no one can pray to anyone this is how ridiculous this sounds. No one can pray to anyone except to the king. Pray to the king? Are you kidding me? And if, if they do pray to the king, they get thrown into the line of dance. And now these folk, these haters are happy. They're happy now. They're high fighting. We got them. We got them. We're going to take him out. We're going to kill him. A little Mr. Perfect. We're going to take him out. Can't stand being in his presence. The king signed the law. It's in effect. Daniel finds out about it. He knows the law is in effect. What does Daniel do? What does he do, church? Do well, let's, let's just read it. Let's just read what he does. Does Daniel do anything different? 610. Now when Daniel knew. Now when Daniel knew. He knew now that the writing was signed. He knew that, that his death warrant was now signed. He knew that. Now you and I have read the story. We know the result. But he didn't know that. As far as he's concerned, now, if he does what he's been doing, he's going to die. So, don't, so take out of your mind, put yourself in Daniel's shoes right now. Daniel did not know that he was going to be delivered. All Daniel knew right now was, if I do what I've been doing, I'm going to die. So, the Bible says that when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in the chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Amen. Daniel knew. Now, there's something odd about this verse. Now notice that in the verse he doesn't change his behavior in the least. Not at all. Even 
though he knows that by not changing his behavior, it will lead to his death. He doesn't change it. Why? Because he loved God more than anything. Even life. But there's something odd about this verse. What's odd about the verse is what is not there. See, the verse describes no deliberation on the part of Daniel. There is no evidence that he struggled in his mind about what he should do. No evidence. This was a simple issue of cause and effect. This was a simple action that involved no thought on his part. He just said in his mind, okay, the decree is passed. I'm just going to do what I've always done. No struggle, church. No questions. Well, uh, should, I, should, I, should I close the window? So they won't see me? The thought never entered his mind. He loved God more than he loved his life. Sure. A requirement of every child of God. Turn with me to Revelation, church. Revelation 12, 11. Let me read this. Let's read this verse together. We need to understand the requirements for these last days. God wants to put us in a spiritual state That's right. that Daniel was in. He wants to put us there. And he, he, the Bible outlines the condition that we need to find ourselves, that we need to, need to be in. Listen to this, verse uh, uh, Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they what? Loved not their lives unto death. See, that was Daniel. You have to love God more than anything, even more than your life. Now, why is that important? Because if you show the world that you love God more than anything, even more than your life, you know what that's going to do? That's just going to draw more people to him. Yes, and then that means that because of your life, more people will be saved. That's right. Amen. And what could possibly be more important than that? Mm. Nothing is more important than saving souls for God's kingdom. Amen. And when you stand for God, no matter what, it draws people to him. This was Daniel. He loved God more than he loved his life. Now it's easy to say, Lord, I will follow you even unto death. You know the story. <laughs> Our friend Peter. And Sister White says that Peter meant every word that he said. He meant it. He meant it when he said, Lord, I would follow you unto death. But when it came time to do it, church, he could not do it. You know why? It wasn't in him. It wasn't in him. So we just can't say today, Lord, I will follow you unto death. Hmm. It's got to be in you. That's right. It's got to be in you. And you can't put that in yourself. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. God has to put that in you. And that means in order for God to put it in you, you have to submit yourself to him so he can put it in you. Amen. What God needs to put in you is his faith and his love. Oh, not this, this, this surface love, this eros and filial we talk about. We're talking about agape love. Whenever love is mentioned in the Bible, in reference to God, it's talking about agape love, which is unconditional. It is divine love that you can't manufacture. That's right. Amen. It's the only love that God has. God doesn't have this other type of love. God only has unconditional love. And God he pledges to put that love in you. So that now you have the ability, as Daniel had the ability, to love God unconditionally. But the only way you're going to get that kind of love is to submit yourself, to surrender yourself completely and fully to God. That's the only way you get it. Amen. If you're half-stepping or half-committing, you can't get that love. God is an all-or-nothing God. Either he has all of you or he has none of you. Wouldn't it be foolish, church, to go through this entire experience with one foot in the world and one foot in the church only to be lost? What kind of sense does that make? If you're going to do it, if you're going to follow God, why not follow him? Because, see, there are so many things he has in store for you, especially in these days. You will never know until you submit.
Daniel submitted. God says, if you allow me to put that love in you, that unconditional love that Daniel had for me, you'll submit too. But if you don't, you won't be able to. You won't have it in you. And I don't know about you, church, I want to have that in me. Amen. I want to have that unconditional love in me. I want, if I'm confronted with a decision to choose life over God, I want the fortitude, the, the spiritual power to say God Amen. and not life. God has to give that to me. And he promises to give that to all of us. So Daniel, now, didn't hesitate to pray, to do what he had all, always done. And I bet you Satan whispered in his ear, Daniel, man, all you got to do is close the window. <laughs> Just close the window, Daniel. See, Satan saw this as a win-win for him. Mm -hmm. Think about this. If Daniel does not keep the law of the king, he'll be killed. And all of his influence and witness is gone. It went for the devil. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if Daniel compromises and avoids his usual routine of praying in front of the window and somehow closes the window or moves away from the window, are praise and silence so no one can see, then he is showing that he is more concerned about his life, that he loves his life more than he loves his God. And Satan could use that against him to snatch his soul. Remember, Jesus said, you must love me more than anything. Now, Jesus says not, does not say that out of arrogance and selfishness. Jesus knows that if you don't love him more than anything, all Satan has to do is to introduce something right. that you love more than him. And then you're done. Mm -hmm. And then you're done. That's right. The requirement that God has for you to love him more than anything is not arrogance. That's not pride. It's love, my friends. It's love. Because if you love God more than anything, you will choose him over anything or anyone, and you will be saved. Amen. Because you will be tested. Oh, yes. You will be tested. Satan sees this as a win-win. Daniel, just close the window. No one has to know what you do in your own house. Just close the window. You can still pray to God. Just, just close the window. Daniel, just a little compromise. That's all this is. You're still praying. Isn't that good enough? That's how a compromise is. But Daniel could not close the window, church. This was a question of loyalty. There could be no compromise. You see, compromise kills. It destroys. It starts small at first, and then it grows into something else. Every last one of us, every last one of us, those who profess to be followers of God, Every last one of us will have a window experience, just like this. Amen. Amen. We will be faced with decisions that will leave room for dangerous compromises of your faith. You will be tested. Satan will arrange it so. Satan has no confidence in you. Huh. If you're not connected to the vine, huh. as we've been discussing in Sabbath yes. school, that means you don't have a divine hands. You don't have the faith. You don't have the love. You have no staying power. Satan knows that. Mm -hmm. Satan can't wait for you to fail. That's right. And so we have to look at our lives and see whether or not we have fully committed ourselves to God. Or are we compromising? See, we will be tempted in these last days to make minor adjustments to our faith in order to survive, to protect our families or keep our jobs. Minor adjustments. See, Satan likes that. He wants us to make these minor adjustments. See, compromise will always be presented as a simple thing. It's just a little thing. The reformer, Martin Luther, all he had to do to be saved it's just repent. repent. 
That's simple, isn't it? Just recant. They told him, listen, Martin Luther, if you just recant, man, you can go back to your family. And John Wycliffe, all you had to do is recant. Just words, just recant. It's simple. That's how Satan presents compromise to you. Just a, a simple thing. Satan will attempt us, church, God's people, to make adjustments to our faith in these last days. It's okay to drink a little wine. It's, it's not going to harm you. We're, we're in love. It's okay for us to, to sleep together before we get married. We're in love. I know it's the Sabbath. I'm just going to break it this one time. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. So I'll go ahead and, and break it this, this one time. Just little compromises that Satan goads you into. Satan is a master mathematician. Now, now why do I say that? He's a master mathematician. He knows that one plus one plus one plus one is four. Why do I say that? Because if you compromise here, and you compromise there, and you compromise there, and you compromise there, what's going to happen the fifth time? You're going to compromise. He's a master mathematician. He knows that this adds up to this, and this adds up to that. If he just keeps on doing it, you keep on doing what you're always doing, you're always going to get what you always got. Amen. Amen. He's a master mathematician. He knows what he's doing. He likes these little compromises, and that's what he's trying to get God's people to do in these last days. And so he knows that if he can get you to compromise these little steps in your life, he knows that when it's time for your window experience, you, can do it again. you will compromise again. That's right. That's right. He knows what he's doing. He knows that if he can get you to compromise over and over again, when you have to decide between your life and God, you've already decided. Because in all these little compromises, listen carefully, church, in all these little compromises, you have chosen yourself over God. So now why would you choose God when it's really time to make a decision? Why? Satan knows what he's doing. If you choose yourself over God multiple times, the chances are you're going to do the same thing when it's really time to make that decision. That's what happened to Peter. So Christ, I would never, I will die for you. Just look at his past decisions. This is what Satan is trying to get you to do, to think about the little things as little, as nothing. And this is why God demands from his people a full surrender. So that there is nothing in you that Satan could possibly use against you. That's why God needs all of you. The decision that Daniel had to make with that window was years in the making. Years of faithfulness. Years of loyalty. Years of falling in love with God. Years of complete loyalty. No compromise. So when it came time no closing the window. Complete faithfulness. In Isaiah 50, verse 7. Isaiah 50, verse 7. You, you can go on over there. Isaiah 50, verse 7. And here's some pages turning. This is Daniel right here. I'm describing this. Isaiah 50, verse 7. You're there. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. Amen. And I know that I should not be ashamed. That word flint means rock. It means it can't be moved. That means that he, you have your face fixed on God. And no matter what's happening around you, your face is like a flint. It's immovable. It's fixed on God. You don't look to the left or the right. COVID comes. Flint. Disasters in your life. Flint. Haters all around you. Flint. Like a rock towards God. Nothing moves you. 
This was Daniel, folks. This was Daniel. His face was like a flint towards God. And this is God's idea for his children today. God says, keep your face like a flint towards me. Don't worry about what's happening around you. Don't worry about these crazy mobs in Washington, D.C. Don't worry about COVID. Amen. Don't worry about any of this foolishness. Amen. Just keep your face like a flint yes. towards me. Amen. Because Amen. I deliver. As you will see Amen. from the story of Daniel. Our eyes must be fixed like a flint towards God. So, they believe they have Daniel. The law has been passed. Now, we just read what Daniel did. The Spirit of Prophecy says that they watched him all day. They watched him. Look, there he goes. Look, he's getting on his knees. He's praying. He's praying. We got him. We got him. No, wait a minute. That's just one time. He might just say that he forgot. Let, let, let's continue to watch him and, and see if he does it again. The Spirit of God said they watched him all day. So they watched him. There he, oh, look, there he goes again. He's getting on his knees and he's praying. That, Man, what is wrong with him? Doesn't he know that if he does that, he's going to die? I know he won't do that again. Let's just stay. Let's just stay and just see if he does it again. He won't be, he won't be crazy enough to do it again. But wait a minute. No, he didn't. He has to go three times to get on his knees and pray to God when he knows his king told him that if he were to do something like that, he would throw him to the line. Let's go tell the king. I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. Let's go tell the I'm, I'm This little picture of perfection, let's get rid of him. Who does he think he is to find the law of the king like that? Let's go tell the king. And they thought, church, they thought they had him. They believe now that Daniel is going to die. Daniel doesn't know what's going to happen. But they believe Daniel is going to die. But they don't account for one factor, church. The most important factor. Amen. The factor that you should always keep on your heart. Amen. No matter what is going on around you, that's the God factor. That's right. That's right. The God who can manipulate circumstances and change outcomes. The God who controls the times and the seasons. The God who can see a problem that you're going to have in the future and transport himself to the future to where the problem is and fix the problem. So by the time you arrive at the problem, it's already fixed. That's the kind of God you serve. They didn't account for that. They didn't account for that. Let's go tell the king. <laughs> it's like a bunch of tattletales. Yeah, right. They went to the king. And, and look, look what they said to the king. Look what they said to the king. Let's look at it. Verse 12. Then Daniel 6 and verse 12. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Listen to this. Hast thou not signed a decree? that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save thee, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altar is not. Oh yeah, it's true. Well, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Then answered they and said, well, before the king, that, that Daniel, that, 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 that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah. In other words, he's not one of us, king. I'm just reminding you, king, that, that that Daniel, who's not one of us, king, he's not one of us, he regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day, king. And I'm sure they told him, we saw him do it. We stayed all day. And king, he got on his knees 
three times and pray to his God. We saw him. Mercy. Oh, yes. When the king heard this, verse 14, he was sore displeased with himself and set his heart and Daniel to deliver him. And he labored until the going down of the sun to deliver him. Now, the king was sad because he recognized that he had made a big mistake, that these men, these, these haters, had concocted this whole thing so they could bring Daniel, so they could destroy Daniel and get rid of them because of their jealousy. And he tried, he thought all day, is there a way? Is there a way I can get out of this? I don't want to kill my friend, my loyal servant Daniel. I don't want to do it. And they became a little impatient. So in verse 15, then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O the O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. King, you can't change it. There's nothing you can do. Throw the man in the lion's den so he can be killed. The king had to do what he had to do. Daniel was thrown. In the lion's den. The king was upset. The Bible says in verse 18 that the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought from him, and he couldn't sleep. Worried about his friend, pacing back and forth. Worried about his friend Daniel. Then the king arose very early in the morning. And the Bible says he ran to the den. He ran there, church. He ran there. And when he came there, he cried with a lamentable voice, the Bible says. A voice yearning, Daniel, O oh Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lion? And he listened intently, and he heard those words that brought joy to her soul. Oh, king, live forever. Oh, king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. Listen carefully. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. That word innocency means purity. Purity was found in me. So God said, no, 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 Daniel. You're not going to die today. I need you. I said, I have plans for you. There's innocency in you. See, when God's people commit themselves and submit themselves to him and allow them to take that muck and that filth out of your lives and fill you with purity, there's nothing that can stop you. Amen. There's nothing that can stand in your way. Daniel said, he has shut the mouth of the lions. And you got some lions out there trying to devour you. Amen. The devil has some imps. You know, the Bible tells us that the devil is the warring lion. Well, he's got some, he got some brothers and sisters who are lions too. And they're trying to take you out. But the Bible tells us in Daniel that God will shut the mouth of those lions. Amen. They can't touch you. This is the kind of power, church, you will have at your disposal if you submit yourselves, surrender yourselves to God. That's power. That's right. All the lions could do is look at him. They couldn't touch him, couldn't even come near him because of the power of God. And as a result of this, and we're closing, as a result of all this, I want to read these last couple of verses so you can see what God wants to do through you. Amen. You can see the whole purpose of the story of this Daniel. Because it has to do with you. You and I. This story is for you and I. This story is about you and I. Amen. Now, why, why, why do I say, let's read this. Here's what happened as a result of all of that stuff that Daniel went through. Here's what happened. Now, you know that with these haters, you know what happened to them, right? Yeah. That the very thing they had planned for Daniel happened to them. That's right. 
The, the very thing they thought they had in the bag, the death of Daniel, it happened to them. See, that's what God does. You can't touch God's people. Do you, and they're trying to realize, thank you, Brandon. Some of you don't know who you are. Some of us don't know who we are. You're a child of the king. Amen. You have no reason to fear man or anything else. God is with you. But listen to this. And we're closing. This is the beauty of this story. This is what, this is what it all comes down to. Right here. And I'm going to read this to you. Verse 25. Then the king Darius wrote unto all the people. How many people? All the people. And who else? Nations. Nations. And languages that dwell where? In all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. But, but look, 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 look at this. Look at this. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Now listen to that. All that happened because of what Daniel went through. All that struggle, all that difficulty because of Daniel was willing to submit himself to be a servant of the king. And as a result of that, that decree, no question about it, resulted in souls being saved. Amen. The king, the president, Amen. put out a decree and said, you are to serve the God of Daniel. Amen. Imagine the powerful influence that had in that kingdom and the world. Because one man, one man chose God over his life. Now, what do you think God wants to do with you? You think that's it? You think there's no more Daniels? Oh, there has to be. Yes. There has to be more Daniels. I dare you today, church. I dare you to be a Daniel. Yes. There's a song we used to sing. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm and dare to make it known. I dare you to be a Daniel today and watch what God is going to do through your life. God needs servants like these in these last days. God needs servants with innocency, with purity. Servants who will turn their face like a flint towards him in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of difficulty. Servants who will follow him even unto death. This, today, in these days, is a question of loyalty. Amen. Whom will you serve? Yeah. Will you go all the way with God? Are you all in like Daniel was? If you are, God has great things in store for you in these last days. Yeah. And he's going to use you to win many souls to his kingdom. And that's all that matters. Yes. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Heads are bowed. And the church is praying right now because perhaps there's someone here who wants to be like Daniel. Yes. Yes. You see, many of us, church, who have been in the church a long time are what we call underperforming. We're not what we ought to be. We're not what we should be because we have not allowed God to put his power and his spirit within us. We're underperforming. Jesus already said that greater things than these you shall do, but we're not doing it. Why? We're underperforming because we have not surrendered everything to God. Everything. Two appeals. Maybe you have not given your life to God yet. Maybe you have it. And you've seen this Daniel. You've seen him stand up for God. And you want to be like that. But you know you got a ways to go. But that's okay. Because whatever God did in Daniel, he can do in you. That's right. Amen. The church is praying. You want an extraordinary spirit like Daniel. That's what you want. I invite you 
to allow God to do that very thing for you today. I'll invite you to ask God to put that extraordinary spirit in you, to put that spirit of love, agape love, to put that, that, that joy in you, to put that faith in you. I invite you right now to ask God to put that in you. If you haven't done it before, I invite you to do it now. And if you want that, if you want that, I invite you to raise your hand today. Raise your hand if you want that. God sees the hands. God sees the hands. And God is promising, church, to do extraordinary things through you today. Extraordinary things. You can't think small when you have a spirit like Daniel. Next appeal. If you've never given your life to God before, you wish to do it now? And you know there is no other person you'd rather serve than God. Because God is good. I invite you to raise your hand. I invite you to raise your hand. You want to give yourself to God right now? You know there is nothing on this earth worth losing your soul over. Nothing. Heaven is cheap enough, church. And so you want to give your life to God? I saw one hand. And if anybody who raised their hand, I'm going to invite you to meet with me in the room right next door to my left. To my left, we're going to pray for you. I'm going to ask you, maybe you want Bible study. We don't know. We want to ask you some questions. So I want you to meet me next door after the service today. And while the church is praying. Church, we've come a long ways. And God has plans for us. He's waiting on us. So I want to invite all of us today to ask God to come into our lives right now and move all that foolishness out of the way, out of the way that is distracting us. And allow him to come in and put a burden on our hearts for souls so that he can use us. And so his love will flow through our hearts out to, to the world and the world can see that there's something extraordinary, something different about his people. Because I have a spirit, an, a, a, an extraordinary spirit within them. That's what God wants to give us today. Yeah. We're going to pray for that right now. And all those who raise your hands because you want that kind of spirit. Lord, help us today. We know, Lord, that we have fallen short, but we don't want to. We need help. Lord, our faith is weak. It is not strong enough, Lord, so Increase our faith. You've told us we can ask that, Lord. Increase it. Lord, increase our love for you. Give us that agape love, Lord, so that like Daniel, we will love you more than anything or anyone. So, Lord, when it's time to choose between even our life and you, we choose you. Oh, Lord, we want that. But you've got to put that within us, Lord, because it's not there right now. Please put it within us. Lord, we know there's nothing in this world worth losing, worth keeping over heaven. Nothing worth keeping. And so we pray for these hands that went up today, Lord, because we recognize, Lord, that we need you. And we're grateful today, Lord, that you're going to do exactly what you said you would do. You're going to complete that work in us. You begun some time ago. You're going to complete it? Because you tell us in your word, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Amen. And we're grabbing onto that faith. And we know, Lord, you will complete it. And Lord, our souls are right now are overjoyed because of what you're going to do in us. And it brings us a peace and, and a faith to know we serve a kind of God who can do everything for us yeah. and is willing to do anything for us. Lord, we would not rather serve anyone else. Yeah. We've never seen love like this, Lord. So we're going to hang on to you. We're going to cling to you, Lord, like our lives depended on it because they do. Thank you, Lord, 
for hearing and answering this prayer. Thank you for what your son did for us to make this prayer possible. Now, Lord, we will look as the flip towards you like a rock, immovable, Lord. We will not look to the left or the right. No matter what is happening around us, Lord, we will keep our eyes focused on thee because, Lord, we know if we do that, you will see us all the way through to the very end until we can see you coming in those clouds of glory. We can see that cloud, the size of a man's hand, Lord, get bigger and bigger. And that retinue of thousands upon thousands of angels coming, Lord, to claim your own. And we look forward to one day standing by your grace on the sea of glass. And being in a place, Lord, where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more evil, no more hate, just peace and love and joy everlasting. Oh, Lord, we can't even imagine that. But by your grace, Lord, we will have it. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. Thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer. prayer. And thank you, Lord, for saving each and every person in this room today because they are willing, Lord, to submit themselves to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for your grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have Ella Robinson come up and...